One of the competitions that's going on on board navigation is who has the best opening or the best cabin door here. Everyone's decorating their cabin doors in ways they seem fit and there's going to be a prize awarded at the end of the cruise. As you can see here we've got uh, Dorothy's red shoes indicating that there is no place like home and uh, a selection of cavalcade of friends on the front of the door. Let's just knock on the door and see if someone's home, shall we? Hello, it's Ben TV. Hello. Hello. Who have we? Got? Hello. Who have we got here? Uh, Greg and Wayne. Okay. Now, uh, what inspired you for your door? Tell us all about your movie-inspired door. Um, <laughs> just basically, um, friends of Dorothy. Mm. The um, the phrase about friends of Dorothy. Um, we developed it from there. And uh, who got to be the Tin Man? Who got to be the Scarecrow, etc. Um, those are two of our other friends, Byron and Josh, and that's Wayne. I'm Toto. We didn't think anyone really should be Dorothy, so I'm actually the dog. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be quite worried that someone's going to make off with your fabulous shoes here. Are they tied down securely? Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're tied. Yeah, they are. And, and look how you found the crew so far. Has your door uh, been open mainly to extra friends? Um, yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. certainly. Yeah. It's been a conversation point. Yeah, so yeah. it's been good. <laughs> but, but it does have the annoying thing of people just knocking on there and just want to have a chat with you when you want to have a sleep, hasn't it, really? Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. Like what's happening now? Yeah. <laughs> In our search for the best opening here on Navigations, we come to U124, which strangely enough, as far as I know, was the only gay German U-boat crew during the Second World War. And to uh, celebrate that fact, we have Horizons Whorehouse just inside. Now, we've got a Do Not Disturb sign, but when has that ever really stopped us? Hello, come on out. Hello. Oh. Hello. Uh, what's your name? Uh, my name is Ron. Now, I believe this is a Horizons Whorehouse by what's on the front of the door there. What are you trying to achieve by this obviously uh, a friendly sign of yours? Well, I think we need to be friendlier than the others, I think. And, um, you know, and one of our advertising agency boys who, who was with us today, Alan, did this fabulous door poster for us. And, and which um, one are you on the sign? Oh, oh, I'm the mother here. I'm the fairy rod mother. So have you had to stop anything, any shenanigans late night? You've had to say, come on, you boys, come on now. Well, they don't come home, you see. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can see you. You, you're keeping the I'm the rod mother, you see, but they don't come home. So they come home, like to get their drinks, and then they go away again. Yeah, I can see you okay. keeping it nice and tidy in there. Look at that. There's <laughs> underpants everywhere. Well, what we expect of a whole house, you know. <laughs> Well here on the cruise there's a plentiful supply of condoms and Akon has got the up your bum campaign working perfectly well here and uh, here on what we call the frotting deck uh, they've been certainly very busy. The thing is you can see there's condoms in here but the interesting fact is that only last night the actual pile was up to here so there's been a lot of work going on in the cabins as you can see but there's still four or five left for those that are still late to the rush. Now I have to put them back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, 
it's around about 3 a.m. now and the party's pumping on there. And this is my after shot. You saw the before shot earlier with the hair. This is the after shot. What do you make of the hair? Uh, uh, yeah, it's great. Yeah. yeah, yeah, not as much spike well, as she, I thought. She but... used both pairs of scissors on it. Both pairs. Yeah, <laughs> scissor hands. Okay, I, I said, look, I, I, I want the, uh, um, I want the uh, Hasselhoff look, and I think I've succeeded in getting it. What do you reckon? Yeah, I think so. Now, how do you yeah. describe the way the party's going down there? It's pumping. It's yeah. pumping. Yeah, half naked bodies, mm. and we're about to pack up the camera and head down and have a few drinks and just sniff it all out. We're about yeah. to have. We're about to sniff it all out. Yeah, yeah. Look, yeah. we're going to go down and, and see what the phrase yeah. "cabin boy" is all about. Junior cabin boy Maynard here, and if there's if there's one thing I can appreciate, it's a good set of conch shells, and we've got people here that have got great conch shells here. Tell me about your outfits. Uh, we, we, we decided to get these outfits because we decided to be the maidens of the sea. Straight off the catwalk of Milan, definitely. Who is your designer? We decided to go with, with the Golo. Go, go low and um, Spotlighty. Spotlighty, yes. It looks like you've been to the church of the $2 shop as well. <laughs> of course we love the $2 shop. Yeah. Now, what, uh, is this your only outfit you've brought on board? What do you got planned? Of course not. We have five different out outfits for, for this um, cruise ship. For every party. Every party you need an outfit, a new one. You can't be seen in the same thing. I said you were saying you're mermaids, but have you got actually a name for it? Have you got a mermaid character? I am Clara Clamshell. And I'm Kiara Kelp. Okay, now, uh, you've got a few kelp cocktails going down there, I see. Yes, we had the Cosmopolitan. Mm. In the piano glass, of course. We've got to step back so we can get a nice wide shot of you. Look at that. Look at that, people. Look at that outfit. In half an hour, it'll be covered in grease, but get a look at it now before it goes, people. Bella doing her makeup right now, one of Australia's most prominent drag queens. How do you describe yourself? I'm one of um, Debbie Rising Star, actually, Maynard. Yeah. Well, where were you discovered? Well, where where did people go, oh, I've got to get some more of this? Well, um, I've been seen over at Stonewall lately, yeah. and that's become a bit of uh, my second home. So um, I've been there for the past three years. And um, now, It may seem, but you're, you're one of the increasingly interesting breed of drag queens that actually sing. Yes, I um, like to classify myself as a bit more unique than the other ones, but it mm. versatile more is the word. Now, is, it a is there a division within the community that there's the, cl the classic ones that mime and there's nothing wrong with that? I can't sing a note myself, so I, I can't blame anyone who can't sing for doing that. Is there, a, is, is there a bit of a problem between the ones that sing and the ones that don't, you know? No, there isn't. It's just a matter of equal work and whatever work you get, it's fantastic, no matter if you mime or if you sing live, but as long as you get the work, is more better. What's the strangest gig you've done? Because sooner or later, a drag queen finds them and is it okay to call you that or is that, is that what, what's your actual def what's on your job title drag queen oh, okay. yes it says that right under the photo yes okay. so, uh, underneath my passport photo drag queen mm. what is the strangest gig you've had to do i think the strangest gig would have to be at a university in a very small stage where you could it was bigger than two shoe boxes worth mm. oh, okay and I had to do proud mary of all numbers you need the room to move with that exactly. you need well, strut strutting space well you room to move and sort of like dancing around in your own living room but anyway look you're about to go on at the uh, Atlantis room there what's the audience like to work with mm. is there any difference in that audience out there tonight no I love uh, performing to an eclectic a bunch of audience and they're all beautiful people you're just rebellion you're basically a show-off aren't you well if I can <laughs> well you get out there and you slay them okay I'll see you soon see you soon mm. bye <laughs> Backstage, the dressing room of the Atlantis room. There's going to be comedy, joy, 
tragedy, all of that going on here tonight, and perhaps a little bit of rolling around on the floor naked. But that might happen a little bit later because it is a cruise ship. And right now I'm just sitting next to Jackie Loeb, who's pretending that... Oh, no, she was pretending I wasn't here, but oh, look, you didn't even know there was a film crew. Absolutely no idea. I now, finished putting my lipstick now on. Now she's a top-class comedian that's been working the cruise ships for how long? I, I started um, about a year ago. Um, my agent had an idea during the layoff season when I'm not out picking cotton that it might be a good idea to send me on board uh, the cruise ships. And what's it been like working to the families and the kids that hang around here? It's, it's an interesting um, contrast to working comedy clubs and doing festivals. It's very, very different. But it's such a diverse, such an eclectic mix of people from from families, I was saying to you before, three-year-olds to people celebrating their 90th wedding anniversary. So you're looking forward to cutting loose here at Navigation tonight? You're going to work blue? You know what, I, I don't even identify myself as a blue comedian. I mean, I don't swear gratuitously. I mean, the word fuck and the C word is part of the English language, so Top why not stuff. saying it? Yeah, look, so I'm if, 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 I, if I'm with someone and they don't say it, they don't get oh, asked back a second time, Jackie. When I say it, I do a joke. I spell it with a PH. Oh, so yeah. it's all right. That's just, that's my justification for getting away with saying it. But, you know, when I work for families and geriatrics, it's pretty much the same act as you see tonight. I believe you've got fight. some confidence juice with you. Oh, yeah, yeah, now, uh, this is everything. A lot of comics have to do certain things to get confidence. Well, I don't have to do illicit substances. Well, I can't because there were sniffer dogs at customs. But I could manage to shove this up my bum. It is bush flower essence confidence. And there's a whole array of them. They've yeah, but got you had a couple of bottles of it at the time. That's <laughs> just one of them. The primary agreement as I was, is, is, um, is alcohol. So, of course, it's going to give you confidence. Six, mm. I, no, no, I lie. 66.6% .6 purified water, 33.3% brandy, and I don't know what the other was. So my mum's had the right idea for years. She's been sucking on the brandy for a game of bowls. Right, and you know what? It works. I feel like I feel like I'm on some illicit substances. There is whether it's a sarcasmatic thing. I don't know, but if it works, it's yeah, great. I have. I've got verbal well, diarrhea. I'll, I'll, I'll go with I'll go with psychosomatic anytime. <laughs> Jackie Loeb, get out there and slay them I'm on the funny stage. To, I can't wait. It's gonna be great. Go with the confidence. I'm terrible. I've got some coke if you want that too. <laughs> no, I'm fine. You're very kind to offer. The Gold Coast Airport, I was just coming back from Schoolies Week 1974. And I met this beautiful woman who was touring around with this right wing evangelical church. And I'm thinking, what can I talk to her about? So, as an icebreaker, I asked her what her thoughts were on homosexuality. She said, Oh no, and I most certainly do not believe that God created them to be with another woman. I mean, you look at the design of the body, you look at the shape. I said, yeah, but there are special adapters you can buy. <laughs> I said, do you own a television? She said, of course I own a television. It's where I get all my knowledge and information from. Well, I said, was it analog or digital? She said, well, it's analog, but I have this little digital box. I said, exactly. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to Studio Q. My name's Pete Dillon and tonight I'm joined by Jared Brody, co-convener of the Victorian Gay and Lesbian Rights Lobby. Jared, welcome to Studio Q. Thanks, Pete. Good evening. How are you going? Well, thank you. Good. We're talking tonight about the relationship register that uh, both cities of Melbourne and city of Yarra have uh, brought into operation in, in recent times. And also Steve Brax, the Brax government has committed to introducing a similar legislation that's based on quite possibly the Tasmanian scheme by end of 07. Um, what, is, what is this Relationship Register scheme? Sure. Um, the Relationships Register um, is a, a register for couples who are mutually committed to sharing their lives together. Um, they are able to go to, along to the register and get their um, a certificate that they are in that, that, that relationship mm -hmm. and thereby have proof or certification that they satisfy the requirements of that relationship. And what does that then entitle a couple to from a, a legal perspective? Sure, sure. Um, a lot of your list watchers might be aware that back in 2001, the Victorian government changed a lot of the laws in relation to domestic partners mm -hmm. so that uh, same-sex couples were treated equally with heterosexual, heterosexual couples um, for a range of areas of law such as um, inheritance, uh, life insurance, next of kin, medical consent, things like that. Um, the problem being that although same-sex couples have those rights, they have no way to prove they satisfy the relevant relationship. Sure. So this, this certification enables them to have an easy way of proving that when they go along and want to claim their rights. Okay, so I would question why the BRAX government would be looking at this option as compared to 
schemes that they have in as, as they have in, in Canada, the UK and Spain, where it's a civil union thing. Would that, I guess, end up with the same result as the ACT, where the federal government would quash that? So, so why this option? I, I guess that's my, my question. Sure. I guess that um, we've seen it successfully operate in Tasmania. Mm -hmm. That's one thing that uh, the, the PRAX government understands and can see that um, the federal government's not going to come in over the top and try and to, to quash it, as you say, mm -hmm. whereas they have done the ACT, and I guess they don't want to fight. Um, and in, in reality, there isn't a lot of difference. Um, the rights that, that are accorded under the ACT civil unions scheme that was mm -hmm. and the Tasmanian Relationships Register are pretty similar. I think this is um, a very soft option on behalf of the Brax government. I think this is um, putting a band-aid on, on an open wound from my perspective. Do you agree? No, I don't at all. I think that it is actually a really progressive um, uh, scheme and alternative for couples who want to have uh, their relationships formally recognised and certified. Um, although uh, they could go further or some say further and do a civil union scheme, um, there, as I said there isn't much difference. The difference in reality being around how couples enter into the relationship, so whether mm -hmm. there is some sort of public affirmation at the time that they enter into the relationship. In my opinion, in, under the relationship registers scheme, couples can do that anyway. Couples can have the right to, to celebrate and have a party. But then we also have a, a, a piece of legislation or doctrine from the Howard government to say that a, a celebrant, and you're suggesting that people can have a, a celebration with a celebrant, that a celebrant isn't allowed to use a term that, that would signify you're entering into a same-sex partnership where they have to use the term man and woman. Well, that's slightly different, Pete, because um, although that there is certain regulations about the terms they have to use within the context of marriage, Celebrants can and do um, celebrate commitment ceremonies and things like that for same-sex couples. Okay. Um, so, so it's not really going to stop them. Is this the springboard or the precursor to something larger down the track? You know, are, are we looking at possibly this being a bouncing board to a civil union scheme? Yeah, I mean, the Victorian Gay and Lesbian Rights Lobby believes that um, we should be aiming for non-discriminatory marriage as our ultimate goal. Um, that, uh, that M word keeps <laughs> rearing its, uh, its interesting head from the lobby. Yeah, it does. But we, we've, we've consulted with the community and that's what mm -hmm. people want. Um, sure. And we think that on the basis of equality, people should be able to have the choice to get married if they want to. Um, so we, we see that federally, that's something that the, the federal government should do. Sure. What are the fundos? You, I use the term fundos, the fundamentalist Christian right. What have they had to say about this scheme in particular? Well, I guess there's, there's quite a, um, a range of those fundos. Some on, on the particular crazy end, I guess, I, I have been um, uh, a bit up in arms and, and protesting the government that this but is... But these are also probably the same people that want to see a stone to death. That's yeah, right. Okay. So, so I, I don't think that that's anything for our community to be concerned about because the government, in my opinion, realises that they really are just a fringe segment of the community and don't have that much control. But aren't um, we a fringe segment of the community as well? No, I don't believe so. Um, the government re recognise that we are um, participants in the community. We mm -hmm. are, are, are you know, full people and, and want to give us the rights that are accorded to every other person, including those, those religious fundamentalists. Right. But you should know as well that there are some um, Christian groups, such as the Australian Christian Lobby, which has been in favour of the Relationships Register. Because it, it, it doesn't involve God, obviously. That's the idea, yes. Sure. We'll have legislation for the Relationships Register later this year. Right. Um, and that'll be the first step. Um, whether we want to go further either at the state-based level or at uh, federally will ultimately depend upon our community getting out there and, and saying what we want to do. Sure. And probably just a, a final question because we are a little deficient in time. The, the political spectrum internationally seems to be starting to turn away from um, the Bush Howards to something a little more small L liberal. Is that going to make a difference? I think so. I think that um, especially at the federal level, if, if we, we have um, a change of government later this year, then there will be a better opportunity for us to engage on these issues and have a public debate about them. Jared Brody, co-convener of the Victorian Gay and Lesbian Rights Lobby, thanks for joining us on Studio Q and we'll see you again soon. Welcome back to Q Focus. I'm Mark. As always, joined again by Colette and Doug. Welcome back. Hi. And Andy, our new panel member. How are you, Mark? How are you going? Um, tonight we're talking about the subject of um, HIV positive people being allowed 
or not being allowed, as it may be, um, into Australia. Um, now, I'm sure we all have pretty strong views on that type of issue, Colette. Well, I think it's quite interesting because really, what, what Howard, Howard's proposing that his government departments of, of health and immigration look into the possibility of testing students, uh, people coming here on student or business visas for HIV AIDS. He's not, he's not, already people who apply for permanent residency in Australia are tested for HIV AIDS. And as obviously we know, if you, age, HIV AIDS doesn't come up in a blood test until at least three months after you've contracted the virus. So obviously the testing procedure is inherently flawed anyway. Mm -hmm. and and he's not, he's not proposing that you test tourists because, I mean, that would be the most stupid thing because <laughs> tourists come in and out of the country and they spend dollars and we need them very, very much. But really, people on student and business visas being tested for AIDS, mm. who's, it's just going to be another big pile of paperwork. I don't think it's going to go through. It's just another example of how doing what he does best, which is playing wedge politics. He mm. is actually also talking about testing visitors. He is actually also talking about banning HIV positive visitors as well, but um, he's, all he's done is ask the Department of Health and the Department of Immigration to look into the possibility of doing that. That's obviously not a very good idea, as you've said, but he, he has included those in the, in the list of people he wants to try and prevent from coming in. Mm. Now, didn't you say before um, we were talking about um, that he's trying to ban um, blacks from Africa coming well, here and that's, that that's that's what this comes back down to. This is a bit of dog whistling and it all started with who else? Pauline Hanson. Mm. Uh, a while back Pauline Hanson, you know, is kept trying to get back into politics, short cash, so she's got to run for the Senate again to get the money. Um, she's um, she made one of her intemperate statements about how we shouldn't allow all these blacks with AIDS to come here and live on welfare and uh, drain our Medicare system and all this other stuff, you know, we should keep them out. And it wasn't very long afterwards when John Howard started talking about um, stopping people with HIV from coming to the country. So he's, he's sort of signalling a, a little racist kind of position here without actually using the word racism. He's kind of cloaking his racism. But Howard actually has gone on record and, record and says, well, not that that means anything, obviously. Howard's <laughs> gone on record plenty of times before. He's actually said that it's a non -core people, with, record, yes. people with HIV AIDS should not be allowed into Australia unless there were humanitarian reasons to let them in, which mm -hmm. would actually let the floods of black immigrants with HIV AIDS and in extreme poverty who are just desperate to come to Australia and leech off the welfare system, the mm. fictitious folks, I must add, mm. come into Australia. Mm. So that if they could manage to get through the immigration system anyway, which is torturous, particularly for someone who, whose second language is English, or maybe they don't even speak um, English at all. It's, it's bad enough if you're English, believe me. <laughs> okay. Um, Andy, would you like to get a word in? For my part, I, I'm not really sure where I stand on this. I think that um, I think that there there is possibly a danger in allowing people from cultures which are relative to our own very different and primarily agriculturally based and very patriarchal to allow people like that into this country who for cultural reasons have a great deal of difficulty being told what they may and may not do with their dick and who don't understand that this is a culture where other people have an interest in what you do with your dick if you have a serious disease. And that's how we run our culture, that's how we run our society. It's, mm. a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a full frontal attack on their manhood to be told that there's something wrong with you and that wrongness stems from something to do with your dick and you shouldn't use it. I want, yeah. There's two things no. I want to say. Yep. Firstly, that <laughs> people who apply for student and business visas generally are not, they don't come under Medicare, they have to have private health insurance. So we're not talking about a burden, financial burden, on Australians. So we are, we are talking about with cultural assumptions of, yes, maybe I'm HIV positive, but I refuse to be protected because I'm a man and I have a right to do this. I can understand that. There are people like that who are walking around right now. And the second is that people who do come in on business and student visas might stay here for a very long time and then shift over to mm. apply for permanent res residency, which of course then they would be tested for HIV AIDS. To be honest, I think it's difficult to come up with an opinion in terms of what I would do in, with, with when confronting this issue. I think mm. it's maybe it's one where we actually need to go away and find out more. Well, th 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 um, 
I'm just looking at a quote here that says the government was not considering a total ban on all HIV positive people but better screening and monitoring including ways of monitoring or banning those who set off warning bells. Who sets off warning I'm bells? I'm not quite so sure quite sure what they mean by warning bells. And Michael Neal, little... I think. Well, yes, yeah. but how do you identify these people ahead of time? How do you identify somebody is likely to behave in a risky fashion? And the, the other thing that, that, that sort of I found slightly disturbing, but again I can see where the government is coming from on this one, is the health and immigration departments are also investigating whether different government agencies should keep track of HIV positive people's movements, immigrants who come here and visitors who come here by some kind of reporting system, I suppose. Then you're being treated like a, a criminal. Oh well, we'll see what they do. Mm. Yeah. All right, we'll have to leave it there. Thanks again, Doug, Colette and Andy. Thank you. We'll see you next time.